Well, Professor Molman, we, uh, th this is the session where I'd like to explore your method, or as, we said, as you said in the car on the way over, lack thereof. If, because you, it seems to me, uh, broke some of the rules of German Protestant systematic theology that, uh, that must have been very much a part of your theological education, so maybe you can tell us kind of what is, because not everyone's familiar with what it means to write a three-volume systematic theology or what it means to write a however many volumes church dogmatics is. But this is the, this is the world um, in which you were reared theologically, and I think it says something about your intellect and your um, uh, adventurous spirit that you didn't necessarily, you haven't played by those same rules of writing a dogmatics or writing a systematic theology. So what, what's that? What's, what's, the normal, what's the normal German way of going about systematics? And, and um, let me, I'll read you something that you wrote and then ask you to reflect on it. <laughs> Every this, is the, this is that preface that I was talking about last session. Every consistent theological summing up, every theological system lays claim to totality, perfect organization, and entire competence for the whole area under survey. In principle, one has to be able to say everything and to not leave any point unconsidered. All the statements must fit in with one another without contradiction, and the whole architecture must be harmonious, an integrated whole. Every theoretical system, even a theological one, has therefore an aesthetic charm, at least to some degree. But this allurement can also be a dangerous seduction. Systems save some readers, and their admirers most of all, from thinking critically for themselves and from arriving at independent and responsible decisions. For systems do not present themselves for discussion. For that reason, I have resisted the temptation to develop a theological system even an open one, and then skipping ahead a couple pages, just this uh, couple sentences. Behind, and then you go on to explain that a little bit. Behind all this is the conviction that, humanly speaking, truth is to be found in unhindered dialogue. This is, this is one of the foundations of the emergent movement in the United States. I'll repeat that line. Behind all this is the conviction that, humanly speaking, humanly speaking, Truth is to be found in unhindered dialogue. Fellowship and freedom are the human components for knowledge of the truth, the truth of God. And the fellowship, I mean here, is the fellowship of mutual participation and unifying sympathy. So how is that different than Karl Barth or the, your other uh, theological uh, uh, predecessors in, in Germany? to try to give a systematic answer ah. <laughs> <laughs> to your question. Uh, we have one great theological system. That's Thomas Aquinas. Uh, he starts with a question whether there is a God or not and uh, develops five ways of proving the existence of God. This is natural theology so to speak, at the entrance of the church. And then he comes into the church and speaks about the revelation of God and Christ and the Holy Spirit, etc., etc. And uh, and I think then he died. <laughs> because because, because uh, all the great theological systems of medieval times must have an open end because of the parousia of Christ they expect to come. It's similar to the great cathedrals of medieval times. They are beautiful, but uh, they uh, were not allowed to be finished at any time because you must keep a, at least a window or a hole open for the coming of God himself. Otherwise, the system of theology would replace the coming of God and the presence of God, and that would be not 
not good. Well, uh, a theological system normally begins with prolegomena. There's a presuppositions. The clearing of the throat. Yes. Yeah. We, have, we have a very beautiful uh, theological system in Paul Tillich's theology, where he develops his question and answer period uh, method at the beginning, and then uh, has a beautiful system. Everything is related to everything in the system, and you can learn it. Uh, but he rarely is quoting the Bible <laughs> and uh, is rarely uh, in discussion with Karl Barth or contemporaries. Uh, I think he, his theology was still in the 19th century while he was living in the 20th century. Mm. <clears throat> so Karl Barth uh, then started uh, with a presupposition the prolegomena to dogmatics are themselves dogmatics. And he started then with the self-revelation of God. Uh, he started twice uh, in 1927 with the Christian dogmatics and then in 1932 with the church dogmatics. He has always uh, failure start and then he starts directly. Uh, there's a commentary to the Romans, it's the same. There was one in 1919 and then came the other one in 22. So this is Karl Barth's unsystematic way of thinking. Uh, the church dogmatics does not start with the general proofs of the existence of God but with the self-revelation of God. So uh, it's a dogmatic inside of the church under the presupposition that there is a church and nobody must convinced to enter a church, but uh, it's for those who are inside. And therefore, Karl Barth was very strong in developing Christian doctrines uh, on predestination, for example, I love his volume 2.2, uh, Inside of Barthians, a dialogue only with 2.2, page 702, and the other one is, uh, but remember, 4.3, uh, page 300, etc., etc. But he was very weak and poor in dialoguing with contemporaries. He was strong in a dialogue with Rudolf Bultmann and nearly overcame the Bultmannian fraction. But he went after 45 to Geneva for a conference with Jean-Paul Sartre, Jean Hersch, uh, French philosophers uh, and uh, scientists. And he came back and said, I, I, I couldn't utter a word. Uh, I should have prayed with them and celebrated the Eucharist. Uh, and this was very strange when I read this, first of all, but then I understood he was not very good in a dialogue with, an, with another presupposition and uh, another philosophy or theology. He was good in developing his own things. Well, uh, we have uh, more than 8,000 pages of church dogmatics from Karl Barth and a very friendly critic once said, the truth can't be so long. <laughs> 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 and indeed, and indeed uh, his uh, fundamental ideas, you can write them down on half a page. Mm. The rest is doxology. And as you know, the praise of God has no beginning and no end. <laughs> <laughs> and that's church dogmatics, <laughs> uh, doxology. <clears throat> well, I, uh, I think I had not to, to resist the temptation to write a system because I'm not a systematic person. Uh, 
I had an impression, an idea, and then I wrote a, a following the Lozi, a loci or foci method, mm -hmm. uh, which Melanchthon started. So there's a question about the, the Trinity, for example, and the Trinitarian God and the one king of the one kingdom, and how does this fit together? And then I wrote this book on the Trinity. Before that, uh, I think it was in 73, I became aware of the ecological crisis and the limitations of growth and uh, started to give lectures on the understanding of creation. Uh, so uh, I then wrote the second book on God in creation and ecological doctrine of creation. Uh, with this I found out that we can, we need, so to speak, a type of theology of nature and a type of natural theology. This is against Karl Barth, of course, because in uh, 1933 and four he struggled with his intimate enemy, Emil Brunner, on, uh, on natural theology. There must be no natural theology only the self-revelation of God. And, uh, but this was not the problem of a theology of nature. It was the problem of political theology of the German Christians who believed instead of the Old Testament in blood and soil of the German race and the Germanic uh, heroic figure of a victorious Christ, etc., etc. So uh, to uh, fight against the German Christians, he said there must be no natural theology. While at the end of his church dogmatics, he developed his own natural theology after the special Christian theology, there can and must be a theology of nature about the, the many lights outside of the one light of Christ and the many words of truth outside of the one word, the incarnate word of God, which is Christ. Uh, but the relationship between the light, which is Christ, and the many lights in the world is like uh, uh, a scheinwerfer. It's uh, if you switch on the lights of your car. Headlights. Yeah. Headlights. Then you can see the back responses of uh, the lights. Reflectors. As the, re re the reflectors. reflectors. So the lights in nature are only a reflection ah. of the light of Christ. Uh, they, can, they do not illuminate anything by themselves, only as a reflection of the light of Christ. Hmm. Uh, and when Emil Brunner, who was uh, the enemy in the struggle about natural theology, read this volume of the church dogmatics, he uh, was curious because he had said the same uh, 30 years ago. <laughs> uh, and Karl Barth then came on the same, into the same result that natural theology or theology of nature is a task of Christian theology. We are not only an ideology for insiders, not only a theology for Christians. We have a theology for the kingdom of God, for the mission to those who are outside. I remember there was a similar struggle between the Yale School and the Chicago School. While the Yale School followed Karl Barth, uh, that Christian theology is only for Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, the Chicago school said, no, it's, uh, it's uh, for everyone who can listen. Because otherwise, there can be no real mission. And I think uh, my st standpoint is theology is uh, a theology of the kingdom of God, which is coming. 
uh, so we have a special starting point, which is Jesus Christ and the experience of the Holy Spirit, and a universal horizon, uh, which we can discover in the New Testament and the letters of the Apostle Paul, Colossians, and every, everywhere. So God reconciled the whole cosmos to himself and made us the messengers of reconciliation. Uh, we need this universal uh, horizon if we want to be faithful to the gospel. But uh, in, there, there is in Karl Barth uh, also this type of uh, hidden universalism, not to reconcile the universe, but to reconcile everybody. But that's the difference.